Over to you, Tanvir. Thank you so much, uh, Azra. I'm very glad that I didn't have my video on. I would have, you know, you wouldn't have liked me react to some of the things you said. <laughs> but yeah, I don't know about the celebrated part or not, but I'm hoping that uh, this is a good conversation for all of us, me including, right? Uh, I've been a big admirer of the DCW initiative of bringing people together and creating spaces for discussion. It's always wonderful to see people talk and interact and exchange ideas because that seems to be the source of almost all of the communities around the world that are not ingested with capital. If you remove capital, the only other important aspect that the community works with is the way that a conversation happens. And I'm really glad that DCW is thinking about this uh, and has been doing this well. Again, another uh, request, perhaps even a disclaimer that I'm hoping that this is the usual turnout. If this is a bad turnout, then all of the blame is on me. Please don't blame you know, any of the DCW members. Maybe my name does not attack people and that's why you have smaller gathering. But if not, then let's just begin with some of the ideas that I have around communities and affiliates, right? Uh, when Afi and I were discussing about what this conversation should be, I really want it to be a conversation, which means that I don't intend to speak for uh, 30 to 40 minutes and then you know do a very artificial or a, a, an extremely, um, I don't know, useless way of uh, engaging with questions. So I will keep my responses pretty short and then we'll see where the conversation takes us. That's the idea that I have. But to begin with, let's try and get some of the terminologies. Uh, and these are not terminologies that I'm defining from any corporate dictionary or any established semantic uh, protocol, but this is lived experience for me, right? So a community is always an organic way of looking at something, right? It's a conscious decision of bringing people who don't agree with you, who have different point of views, which means that a community would never have the exactly the same opinion. To assume that a community will have the same opinion is probably a very bad way of imagining a community because what you're imagining yeah. there is a clique, C-L-I-Q-U-E, that's a clique, which means that you all agree on the same things, you have the same opinion, you have no dissent, you have no divergence of opinion. That is not a community. That is just a bunch of people who want to agree and who want to have a, a voice of theirs together. A community inherently has two things in it. The first one is the diversity of the opinion. The second one is a distinct quality of dissent. And dissent is always political in nature, which means that you will be speaking against privilege. You will be speaking against certain set practices. You will be speaking against certain established methodologies because that is the strength of a community. Now, let's try and extend that uh, that formulation a little more. One might ask if community is always organic, then what happens to the failings of the community? What happens to when communities don't always thrive and succeed? It's a very interesting question to ask, but it's also a slightly misguided question because the end result of a community is not success. To think that we are going to form a community and achieve success is a very... Is a very um, is a very naive notion of thinking of a community. A community is a tool to fight the good fight. You're not there for results. You're not there to make sure that everything that you think with the world is wrong gets fixed. There are different mechanisms to do it. That's why we live in a democratic setup. That's why we have political systems. A community is essential because it is probably the best way to express dissent without being violent or without taking the law into your hand. All community formulations when it is devoid of violence, lead to a healthy discussion. And that is incredibly important when you look at the open knowledge movement. Again, extending that a little further, if you were to ask, so what happens if you were to think of success as your keystone or success as your founding philosophy? Then you're not working with a the community. Then you're thinking of a network. A network inherently, again, means that you are committed to certain outputs, certain deliverables, certain code of functioning that you would meet, I don't know, every week, that by the end of three months, you'll have a report ready. At the end of six months, you'll do something that is significantly better than how you start. Does a community not have those deliverables? Does a community does not have that pressure? It does. It obviously does, and it should take that forward. However, 
a community is under no obligation to do it as a performative activity. It is not a performance. A network must perform. A network must achieve. A community, like I said earlier, is enough if it fights the important fight, if it fights the good fight, right? So there are always going to be lows more than there are highs. You are going to find people not show up. You are going to find people show up in large numbers. You're going to find people come and appreciate and validate a lot of ideas that you share out. But there might be days when the communities you know, don't even don't even reverberate, don't even resonate at a very simplistic level. All of these are parts of the way or are essential episodes in the way that a community operates and structures and performs. Now, there is a, that is, there is a governance question attached to it, in this, right? Which is the affiliate part. What I might be saying might be provocative in some context, but I stand true to what I'm going to say now. All affiliates are communities, but all communities are not affiliates. Because an affiliate cannot function if it does not if it does not imbibe, if it does not gather the values and the ethos of the community that it intends to serve, it intends to be of service to. So when an affiliate is formed, whether it is the BCW, whether it is the Karavadi Wikimedians, whether it is the Odia Wikimedians, whether it is the Kerala Wikimedians, whether it is the your grandmother Wikimedians, I think there is something like that in the Wikimedia ecosystem. There is a media wiki user group. Any user group or any affiliate that you want to consider in the Wikimedia ecosystem cannot be functional if it does not become or if it does not come to the service of the community that works well, right? So all affiliates are communities, but not all communities are affiliates. Now, is that a bad thing? Not always. Because becoming an affiliate moves you towards the spectrum of the network, right? We established that. On the, if you were to think of, uh, you know, independence or being completely autonomous, community is where the spectrum begins. A semi-formal structure of having some independence but having some rules and regulations is the affiliate structure. At the end of the spectrum is a network where you have very clearly defined guidelines, defined rules to work with, right? Now let's talk about the different ways in which the communities have come together in India. And I only speak about India because in my limited understanding, I think I can only do just to that particular context. Now, in India, communities came together for three crucial reasons. The first one was a very existential reason that you had to do something about it. If you wouldn't do, then that entire conversation, that entire cause would be lost. You had to raise your voice. You had to do something. You had to you know, think of an affirmative action. Silence was no longer an option, right? So that's how the first kind of communities came together. The second set of communities came together in India because of opportunity, because of, you know, uh, an inherent social capital privilege that you exercised. You had received good education. You had received the benefits of the growing world. You had been part of various discussions, discourses, which helped you understand how else might you talk about these questions. So that comes because of a particular kind of awareness, a particular kind of social capital, which was not always available in the Indian context. That's how the second set of communities came together. A lot of communities around education, around health, around uh, you know sanitation, you know, have their roots around this. The final set of communities come because of an opportunity or a challenge. So I'm also considering, and that's a big part of our conversation today, is challenge always a challenge or is challenge an opportunity in some other form, right? So the third kind of communities came together because of this, this opportunity that came to you or in this challenge that came to you, which is not a challenge 10 years ago or 15 years ago. For example, 20 years ago, if you were to talk to somebody who worked in the labor movement, they would not have imagined that gig economy would become such a big thing. And the questions of data, the questions of privacy, the questions of minimum wages, the questions of health and other insurance, you know, basically affirmative actions that a state should be uh, offering would now also become corporate concerns. So that labor movement had not imagined what kind of challenge and what kind of opportunity would come together. So in very broad terms, and this is a very reductive argument, of course, there are a lot of nuances. There is politics involved. There are social causes involved. There's a whole lot of geography that's involved in how communities formulate. But these are the broadest of the sketches, so to say, of how community has come together in the Indian context and perhaps in the South Asian context. The first one was a very, very existential risk. You had to do something. The Chipko movement is an example to that. The way that 
you know, uh, sites have come together to save environment, to save social uh, values. All of that comes at that level. The second one because that comes because of higher education, because of awareness, because of social privilege, are the ones which looks at violence, which looks at domestic abuse, which looks at you know all of the social problems that we face. All of those things, right? The third one is all the new age challenges that we see, new age opportunities that we see, and how the communities have come together. Now it's important for us to place where does the Wikimedia movement or where does the Wikimedia community sit in this construct? Now, it's easy for us to think that the Wikimedia community sit in the opportunities and the challenges spectrum, right? Because, yeah. again, 25 years ago, if you were to talk to a professor in the university, nobody would have imagined that a platform like Wikipedia would come and make their life both easy and difficult, depending upon which way that the professor wants to lean. Because if the professor wants to say that, oh, Wikipedia is completely... Uh, demoralizing my students and it is taking away all of the rigor from research, then they are going to be anti-platform. But if they are going to use the platform for their own reading, for their own understanding and develop a healthy connection, develop a healthy relation, maybe they are looking at a very different way or a different assessment of that platform, right? But if you look at closely, the Wikimedia movement also has some roots in the second set of the communities that we talked about, which is go back, you know, five years, 10 years, uh, DCW might not be a good example, but I see there are Wikimedians from the Odia community here, Wikimedians from Bangla, Wikimedians from Karawali, I think Wikimedians from Telugu, Punjabi, right? Go back 10 years and 15 years. The first people, the founder members, if you were to use that term, they did not stumble on Wikimedia. It was not like, oh, I'm roaming around the internet and suddenly Wikimedia comes to me and I'm going to engage with Wikimedia. It was a conscious search towards how do I engage with a question of language, knowledge, information, and people. So all of those four factors are very important. That is, how do I work with Telugu language on the internet or on the digital? What do I do to identify knowledge sources? How do I use the knowledge to share information? And where does this information or how does this information go to my people, go to my community? So it is part of a question, it is a part of a rigorous education, awareness, thinking, critical abilities that led to the Wikimedia movement formulate into communities. And that's been the USP of the Wikimedia community, right? That it has not remained as an individual effort. There are a lot of technology support. There's a lot of technology support that's going around in the Wikimedia movement. There are bots that are working. There are many, many partner institutions that are now with the AI coming up, the LLM models. There's a very distinct way in which the emerging technology is going to change how the Wikimedia interactions is going to be. It might not be in the same volume or at the same scale, but this was also a possibility 15, 20 years ago. But this did not happen. Wikimedia projects did not remain individual centric. Nobody who worked in our linguistic community said, okay, I'm going to contribute and I'm going to stay silent. That was not the case. We said that we are going in to work. Progress. We are going to work and we are also going to ensure that the other community members come together. And that is what I meant, that you were not looking only for people who agreed with you. That is why the Wikimedia communities are not a clique. You went to people who were generally in agreement with the larger idea of knowledge sharing, who were generally at a level of skills that were going to be helpful in the way that you would engage with the community. So that's how the first kind of communities came together. Right. Uh, yeah. So the, the next obvious question to ask is, are all of our communities doing good? Now, anybody with a very cursory understanding, with a simplistic reading of our projects would be able to say that's not true. A lot of our communities are not performing well. And there are reasons to it. Not all of the reason is about efficiency. You simply cannot say that, you know, Canada community, because it is not, uh, it does not have the same amount of articles as Telugu community is not doing well. There is a social history to why we are not able to do it. There is a very pertinent reason, a geographical reason, a historical reason as to why that is not happening. So let's try and understand what are some of the complexities around you know, the way that the communities and the affiliates are, are working. The first problem is a structural problem, right? What is the structure of a Wikimedia community? The structure of a Wikimedia community is extremely porous which means that it can take in everything and not be colored, or it can take something and be very distinctly colored. 
that anything can make a community or break a community. That is, you know, amorphous. Yes, you know, uh, it is amorphous. So uh, let me explain with an example. If you look at some of the high points, if you go to the metrics of uh, certain communities, if you look at the way certain communities work, there's a particular peak point of a community where it's just a handful of people who decide, come, let's do something. This is March. No, this is the month that we are going to come together. We are going to work on women's uh, history. Let's do something. Or this is August. This is going to be the month of uh, India's independent celebrations. We'll work together. So it can take in all of these and then work with that external stimulus. But if you remove that external stimulus, it can also be dormant for a very, very long time. So structurally, there is nothing which, which can be the equivalent of, say, a self-sufficient, a self-reliant model of engagement. Now, are there individuals who don't do this on a daily basis? Absolutely. They do it 24-7, they do it 365 days, they do it for five years at a trot, all of this. But does it translate into a community effort? So there is X missing there, that the high-performing individual and a low-performing community, something is missing. And that something is the structure. Structure of engagement, structure of conversation, structure of the technology that is offered to us. So structurally, it's a very difficult conversation to explain how Wikimedia platform works. What do you get out of a Wikimedia platform? All of you who are in this conversation, I'm sure, have had at least one conversation trying to explain to somebody what is the benefit of working with Wikimedia platforms? And what is your best answer? Your best answer is it helps the society, right? You might say it in a different language. You might say it in a, with a different adjective. But the best answer is that it contributes to the betterment of the society, right? There is literally no other way that you're going to say that if I contribute to Wikipedia, I'm going to be considered for Bharat Ratna after 15 years. Not true. That's not going to happen. So structurally, you're working with a project that does not believe or that does not codify your performance, does not codify your contribution, that does not you know, in, in any way have an extractive value around what the knowledge that is. All of the content of the Wikimedia platform is free to reuse, right? We would be able to benefit from it in the way that we seek to be, we seem better. So there is literally nothing at the level of a community that can take that conversation forward. So structurally, it's a very difficult. Now, the second problem, and this is probably very pertinent to the South Asia context, is the regulatory complexity. I will not touch the resources because I want to talk about resources at the end. So regulation is always difficult, and India, with all its is always has always been difficult. You, you know, uh, what do you do? Do you register as a society? Do you register as a trust? Do you register as a section of company? Or do you become an Article 25? What are your options, and how long will you work with it? What are going to be your regulatory filings? How will you understand the different mandates? Just uh, in the past one year, the government of India has changed the income tax filing for not-for-profit organizations in a very considerable way. According to our auditors, it has changed up to 40%. So how would an organization that is just now coming together, or how is a community that is now looking to organize themselves, keep abreast of all of these regulations? Again, an easy answer is there should be a central mechanism, there should be advisors. But for that advisors to happen, there are regulations again. Now, this regulation is both political in nature and also legal in nature. The legal part can be understood. What are we going to do about the political influences? What are we going to do? No, about... what, are we going... what are we going to do about the political emphasis that comes because of certain conversations, because of certain manifestations of bias? So regulatory challenges are huge. Regulatory, regulatory complexities are huge, right? The other problem is the capacity problem. Again, I want to keep finance out of it. I come to it later. But just think of the capacity of, you know, you have to, once you become a community or once you become a community that is organized in nature, you have certain things that you want to commit to. Like I said earlier, a community does not have to commit to anything. The, the only thing that the community has to commit is to the idea that it wants to propagate, it wants to fight for, or it wants to advocate for. But if you become organized, if you become an affiliate, you have to start thinking about how do you navigate certain expectations? What is your internal report? What is your annual report? What is your midterm report? How are you going to develop a communication plan? What is going to be your policy for ensuring posh? 
what is going to be uh, you know your uh, your policy for ensuring that equity is ensured across all of your decisions what is your representation policy what is your labor policy do you have a minimum wages if you are ever going back all of these questions come down to basically do you have the capacity to do it if you have the capacity to do it great but not all of our communities have that kind of capacity right the next one would be a very interesting complexity. And again, this might not only be a complexity, it might be an opportunity. But I'm saying it's a complexity because we have not understood fully. It is the changing landscape. In the last 10 years in India, we have had so many discussions about how technology is going to change our world. That's not true of the people of my generation. The only technology that scared us was the Y2K problem. I don't know how many of you belong to that era, but Quite literally, we were very afraid. We were told by our computer teachers, and this is the emphasis, that our computer teachers did not know what Y2K would do to the technology world. But if you look at the tech conversations in the last 10 years, there have been many, many models that have evolved and changed the landscape of what it means to contribute in a digital ecosystem. A few years ago, there was the big data, right? And then there was the big conversation about uh, LLM, uh, large language models. Then there was machine learning. Now there is generative AI. I don't know what is going to be next. There's going to be something else. In between, there was also the conversation about how video is going to completely obliterate text. That did not happen. Everybody took the video uh, wagon seriously and said video is the next way to disseminate and incorporate knowledge. But yes, did video change certain things? Yes. But I don't think it completely you know, shook our foundations of understanding of knowledge, understanding of creation and dissemination of knowledge. So the landscape has been evolving so fast that we have not been able to keep up. It's always the technology that has the advantage of moving fast, right? So if you if you were to plot this, the easiest of the particle or the easiest of the component that changes faster is the technology. Then comes a policy. The technology changes, it has its ramification, it has its impact. Then we start thinking about what is the policy that we need to come up with? What kind of regulations, what kind of laws, what kind of understanding should we have? Finally, we develop a culture around it because the culture takes the longest of the times, so the most difficult of the times to change. It's not easy even to this day in India to talk about domestic violence, all right, or to talk about abuse. Why? Because our culture has not kept up with the law or with the policy. So similarly, technology changes very, very quickly. The policy changes you know, a little later, but the culture changes even more dignified. That's again the reason why a lot of you would encounter very old fashioned, very, very um, archaic responses to what a platform like Wikimedia would do. Why contributing on Wikimedia Commons is a bad idea. Why sharing knowledge on an open platform is, is not in, in favor of the society or is not in favor of the general uh, knowledge ecosystem, right? So that's the example. The next complexity that we face is the challenging and the changing ethos of engagement. When the 15 years ago that we were talking about when Indian Wiki, uh, Indian Wiki started to formulate, I think the only incentive of that formulation was some kind of altruism or some kind of service that you wanted to contribute. Over a period of time, a lot of new factors have come into it, which is, you know, it's an addition of skill. It's also a way to find an opportunity for employment. It's also an opportunity for you to see what are the different engagements that are happening. It's also your lens to look into the world and see what are the many different things that are happening that you can be part of. So there has been a change in the ethos and the engagement as well. So the idea of the community and the idea of the affiliate have also shifted significantly. It's no longer, I'm going to sit in my room, <laughs> which is the version that a lot of Wikimedians would very fondly remember, is to say, I will have my computer, I'm going to sit in front of my room, which has a very, very bad or very, very slow internet, but I'm going to keep at it and I'm going to do my best to contribute to the Wikimedia. Right now, I don't think that's the only way of contribution. Right now, that's not the only way that we are supporting engagement. There are so many different ways. And that change of ethos, change of engagement is definitely a, a, a point of complexity. And how do we overcome it? We have to have more conversations. We have to make sure that our point of view is in alignment with other points of view. 
and what is the middle ground how do we not break a community that's going to like I was referring earlier, the last point that I want to talk about around complexity is the complexity of the resources. Of course, there are legal and state-related uh, regulations. All of you must be aware of the FCRA complexity, so I'm not going to go in depth uh, on it. I don't also want to go into depth, of, uh, depth on it because I'm not a competent authority to speak of it. But suffice to say that the FCRA rule is a very, very difficult rule or a law to understand, to ensure, and to implement so you need a lot of advice, you need a lot of checks and balances, you need to have a robust structure of governance to it. So that already makes the resources difficult. Now, there is also another, another significant difficulty here, which is how do you sell the idea of Wikipedia in India? Or how do you sell the idea of Wikisource in India? Or how do you sell this idea of the Wikidata in India? Wikidata to a certain extent is easy because of the growing tech consumption, right? And also the emergence of the generative AI. But what about our other projects? How do you communicate that these are important projects for investment? These are important projects that should be funded. Because to this day, what we see is the knowledge structures of the knowledge equation, which are always, you know, pedagogically one-sided in nature. Uh, let me give an example. Our imagination of knowledge is so besotted with the classroom model that we believe that whoever is trained and is accredited with a degree or with a certification is the only one who can impart knowledge. That's the reason why our classroom models are one-sided models. How do you replace that one-sided model with this addition model, with this peer review model, with this community developed model? So you're not going to get resources for it. But there is a silver line also. The silver line is all of the emerging conversations around languages. It might not be around English Wikipedia. But it is definitely around Marathi Wikipedia. It's definitely around Odia Wikipedia. It's definitely around Tamil Wikipedia. Because it is the it is a very important objective of the state to also ensure that the lowest denominator in their constituency under their care has the same opportunity, has the same access, has the same resources that can contribute to social growth. So that's the opportunity that it has. The last complexity around resources that I want to point and move on to. Uh, the other discussion is that please remember that resources not always or don't always solve the problems. Resources inherently is a challenge or inherently is a responsibility that you have to be prepared to take up. It's easy for us to imagine that, oh, if only I had 50 lakh rupees, I would have solved all the problems that my community is facing. It's not true. The minute you're going to get 50, oh, 50 lakh rupees or 50,000, whatever that number is, there are going to be a set of problems that will come with that. There is going to be the problem of accounting. There is going to be a problem of ensuring uh, uh, ensuring the right uh, parameters. There is going to be a problem of what are the right expense structures. There is going to be a, a problem or a question of who is going to be uh, responsible for these things. So coming to resources also requires a lot of capacity. So if there is any of you who think that if I get, I don't know, 10,000 rupees, I will be able to work on this problem, remember that you might be able to solve that problem, but you are going to come up or you, are, you will have to face another big question for which you need to be trained, for which you need to be prepared to encounter or to address some of those concerns, right? Uh, how are we doing on time, Azra? Yes, so you can speak. We have uh, 30 minutes more left. You can uh, go on. How much? 13, you mentioned. Azra. 30, 30. No, 30. it's can take 20 uh, minutes. 20 minutes. Yeah. If it's okay with you, I'll stop after the next uh, six, seven minutes and we'll open it up into a conversation. Okay. Yeah, yeah, that's fine. That's cool. Uh, I want to move away from this bleak thing that I was talking about how difficult it is for communities. Like it's like I mentioned earlier, a complexity is not just a challenge, it's also an opportunity. So if you were to ask ourselves as to what are the opportunities that the Indian communities can buy in or can leverage from. There are some very easy answers. These are the these are the you know cliched answers that everybody wants to give. The first answer is the demography, right? That it's India is a young country. We have a very young population. Our demographic dividend is very high. I'm not saying that's not true. I'm just saying that it's so repetitive and it's so cliched that it's both an answer and it's also an obfuscation of an answer. It doesn't answer anything. 
the other thing that people usually say is that look at all of the opportunities that are opening up you can do x you can do y you can do z again that's not really an answer what are those opportunities is that opportunity always equitable in nature does it have aspects of social justice embedded into it we don't we don't go into those questions right yeah. so i did try to take a little bit of a deeper dive into this and the nuance that i want to to identify and to discuss with you is to move away from numbers or is to move away from that glamorous big picture of india is a young country what are our opportunities what are going to be the points that we will be able to use for leverage the first and the foremost thing that we have as an opportunity is the willingness to build right we have always been thinkers we have always been people who have been able to innovate on certain things it took a very very long time for us to i don't know start the first wikimedia project in india but the minute we started we were able to replicate it there is an inherent ability in us to build something and i'm not only referring this to at the level of the technology even at the level of the social movements even at the level of the civil society even at the level of an an economy that is not structured or that is not tuned into technology you can see this you can see this in a very big way that we have the willingness and the ability to build right the second point that's an opportunity for us is we might not always recognize this but we have a very robust ecosystem of open knowledge now this might come as a surprise to many of you where you are struggling to find who is the other wikimedian in the city that i live in or which is the other open knowledge movement that i can be part of but please remember that some of the best contributions to open knowledge ecosystem whether it is open science whether it is open medicine whether it is open data whether it is open access comes from india you have some of the best library institutions who have contributed to the discourse on open access open medicine even to this day open medicine civil society group is a important stakeholder while you take decisions around the access and the availability of machines open data communities have been extremely strong and have contributed so there has been a growing tribe of the open source the growing tribe of the open knowledge and the some of the citizen science initiatives that were conducted in the 70s and the 80s were actually champions of open access right if you talk to the people who built majority of our institutions the inherent philosophy of those institutions were to provide access in a bigger way in a much more um, in, in a much more egalitarian way than access was imagined previously the the, the other uh, opportunity that we have in front of us is it's it's a very messy transition okay but it's an opportunity the messy transition that i'm referring to is between these tripartite agreement or a tripartite arrangement between language culture and technology let me give an example take an instagram reel that talks about an odia folk song now is that the best of the videography or the choreography that you can imagine probably not but has it been able to gather many many views and become viral it has that messy transition where we are not waiting for the perfect solution or the perfect gadget or the perfect technology perfect software to do it that willingness to work with messy transitions that i'm going to bring my language my ideas my culture into the platform of technology and ensure that there is a conversation around it that very willingness that very attitude is a amazing opportunity for us what this means is that the articles that we are going to write the documents that we are going to proofread the images that we are going to submit might not be perfect but our willingness should not be curtailed should not be contained saying that will become perfect and then do it to err is one of our biggest virtues right the last point that i want to uh, want to mention and and probably sum up everything that i've been saying until this point is please remember that the opportunity that we have in this ecosystem of the south asian communities of this projects the scale is so huge that you can never mess it up that you can never make something uh, a historical mistake uh, to explain this further what i'm trying to tell you is whether you are a telugu wikimedian or a kannada wikimedian or a karavali wikimedian your language has so so much of rich history so much of rich tradition such a rich culture such a rich uh, uh, rich literary tradition that your one article that is wrong will never decimate or will never 
become the spokespiece or the speaking point for everything that your language or your culture stands for. So you have the opportunity to go ahead and make as many mistakes as you want. The ability to create something that is not perfect is a great opportunity, which is not the opportunity that you have on the German Wikipedia, which is not the opportunity you have on the English Wikipedia. You expect a certain kind of perfection participating there. So I essentially don't think that's even participation. That is still performance, right? But Indian language Wikipedia, South Asian Wikimedia platforms are really for participation. So did Pavan get a Telugu article wrong? Did, did he get his facts wrong? Telugu language is not going to come to an end today or tomorrow. It is just going to say, okay, this is wrong. We are going to improve it and move ahead. That, that inherent ability to not be bothered, to not be bogged down by a mistake, by something that is not correct, is a great advantage. And we should all embrace around it. Right? Uh, I think I've spoken a lot. I do have more points. But I'll pause here. Maybe I'll just stop here and see if there are, I don't know, uh, reflections, agreements, disagreements. And then we can pick up the conversation. Does that sound good, Azra? Yeah, yeah, sure. So we can have a, a question moment, a question answer moment, so that we can move further ahead. So let's do that. Is that fine with you? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I, I absolutely yeah. want this to be a conversation. Yeah, yeah. Else. So for now, we are like open to questions for some minutes. So anyone who is interested in asking anything about whatever we discussed till now, so they just come with up your questions. You can unmute yourselves or just raise the hand. Uh, there is a question in private. Uh, someone is asking about uh, a few, uh, you know, some more uh, detail on the difference between the affiliates and communities. Uh, maybe a sentence or two that explains it for someone who is a new buyer. Sure, I'll try my best, but I think there are better people who are just, uh, who can, I mean, there are people here who can better answer. So, the easy way to explain an affiliate is that they have formal recognition. So they are affiliated to the Wikimedia Foundation, which means that there is an official understanding between the Wikimedia Foundation and this particular group that there is uh, there is an understanding around the usage of uh, uh, copyright, usage of logos, you know, hallmarks, all of those things. And you also automatically become eligible for certain uh, for certain positive actions, certain resource dispersal, certain uh, conversations that are not always open to all of the community. So like questions around governance, questions around strategy. Not that governance and strategy are always only discussed with affiliates. The community has a big role to play in it. But it becomes part of your agreement, part of your engagement, that you would also be a partner into those discussions. Right, that's the easy way of understanding the affiliation and the difference the difference between affiliate and a community. Uh, yeah, thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, am I audible? I had a question. Uh, so. Azra, am I audible? Yes, yes, Afaf, you can speak. You're audible. Okay, thank you. Um, so, hello, everyone, and hello, Tanvi. Um, it was really a pleasure to listen uh, to you and uh, how you explain things, which is quite intricate as well as it just gets you, you get the point of it. Um, so, my question might be not as nuanced as your 
talk but i was just thinking as a newcomer if uh, in the wikimedia movement i've seen um for example whenever i'm going to the pages there are these uh, groups whereby they have mentioned Germ german wikimedians or uh, i think they denmark has some then brazil has a group so i was just wondering in india do we have a centralized group community or some sort of a replication of that it's not that we need to have it but i just wanted to know is there a possibility for it and does something like that exist right now uh, sure i'll try my best so there was an entity similar to all the examples that you gave which was at that point called wikimedia india chapter the abbreviation was wmin uh, for a variety of reasons, WMIN is no longer uh, active. Um, is there a scope for us to come together and to create another centralized body? Theoretically, yes. But practically, and this is my personal opinion, but practically, I think the answer is in diversification and not in centralization. Considering the many, many different user groups that we have, interests that user groups pursue, the intricacies of the communities and the nuances that the projects have, having a centralized body will not serve the same purpose, say, that it would have served in a few years ago. So, yes, uh, technically, there is always, I mean, theoretically and technically, there is always scope for us to come together and to form a centralized body. And historically, there has been an organization, the Wikimedia India chapter, which uh, contributed a great deal in setting up the Wikimedia movement in India, introduced some of the earliest of the communities, uh, you know, uh, offered support in a variety of ways, ensured that there was a lot of programmatic and also a lot of community level support for emerging of the new projects or new initiatives. Uh, I see Subodh has a hand up. Thanks. Subodh, over to you. Yeah, thanks. Uh, Tanvir, I think you have uh, like explained the fundamentals uh, of the moment, uh, the structures, the communities, the volunteers, etc. So, uh, like, uh, I have one uh, like question always in mind that in India we have legacy of all the people's movements, uh, say it, literacy movement, then the RTI, our right to education, many environmental movements. So people uh, came together voluntarily and uh, fought and worked for years uh, to achieve many things, uh, imparted a lot of knowledge to the people. Uh, make them aware and then build the moment. So uh, what is missing in the Wikimedia movement that is in India that uh, we are not, we, we, we don't have much connect with the uh, society uh, as such in my opinion and we are like always working in isolation and people are just staring at us sometimes uh, uh, giving some helping hand, sometimes uh, neglecting like that. So uh, how do you see this? Uh, this is my one uh, observation and I need your uh, comments and elaboration. The second thing uh, I wanted to like just uh, explore, uh, like we need to go to the roots, root cause in my opinion, that we, have, we, all, we, we are always skeptic about coming together uh, as a group, then working together as a group and then sustaining together. Uh, as a group so is there are there any inherent uh, characteristics in our uh, indian mindsets or the culture organizational culture uh, what how do you see uh, at this aspects yeah thanks thank you so much what a lovely question the first question is is beautiful right i mean <laughs> I'll be very honest, and, and this might come across as a very critical uh, take on the Wikimedia movement. Wikimedia, media, Wikimedia movement is an open movement, but in the Indian context, it's not a people movement. All the movements that you mentioned, Subodhji, and just for context here, Subodh has a history of working with social movements for you know, more than 30 years. So that's the context that he's bringing into the conversation. Right? You take RTE, for example, you take RTI, for example, you take the Chipko movement, you take all of the movements that we have had around saving of the environment, around ensuring uh, justice to uh, you know, sexually harassed women, all of that. Those are all people movements where technology did not play a big role. In the Wikimedia movement, 
somehow, unfortunately, it is a technology driven open movement, open people movement. So the technology is always going to be a challenge when you're going to speak and this group itself, irrespective of the very different social backgrounds that we have, we are still very, very privileged. We have internet, we have electricity, we have the know-how to operate a, a slightly foreign medium, so to say. So all of our so-called social revolution is happening on a platform that is alien and that is inaccessible to more than 85% of our constituents. So how do we expect it to become a people's movement? It is people in the term of participation, not in the term of activity. If you get 100 people and all of them to contribute, and that's when it becomes, if your total constituency is 100 people and 90 people or 80 people participate, then it becomes a people's movement. For a country that has 1.4 billion people, having 1,000 people or 10,000 people contribute to it will not make it a people movement. It will certainly make it an open movement. Definitely not a people movement. The second question moves, I mean, flows directly from the first question, right? So what can we do? I think that there are two ways to look at this. The first one is, how do we make our projects non-platform specific or non-technology dependent? The offline Wikipedia is a great example. What Kidix does is absolutely fascinating. And the second thing is, the Wikimedia platforms or the Wikimedia projects juxtapose a very inherently Indian thought that wisdom and knowledge comes from deep labor, deep practice, and a very long engagement of something. Knowledge has always been seen as a mark of respect. And what Wikimedia projects do is inherently challenge that idea and say, I don't have to be, a, I don't have to be an expert or I don't have to be a PhD in microbiology, but I can still contribute to knowledge. So one part of that is the technology. The other part of that is the culture or the way that we understand knowledge. The more we make knowledge democratic, the more this movement is going to become people friendly. The more we are going to make it less technology specific or less internet digital specific, more people are going to get associated with it. The classic example is your work. I want to spotlight Subodh's work, where he's trying to work with a host of institutions who are releasing content freely and we are digitizing it. And once the digitization happens, it's available offline. Now, what is the best use case for it? We'll have to think. We have not been able to create a campaign, create a movement where people are, you know, virally downloading books that we digitize. But if that ever happens, that one book is digitized, you know, I don't know, 10,000 times and it gets forwarded on WhatsApp, it gets forwarded on Telegram, excerpts of it become your, uh, you know, your screenshots, your screensaver images then we'll definitely make it into a people's movement. Long answer, but I'm saying the Wikimedia movement has been an open movement in the Indian context, but not a people movement. And Wikimedia movement has been both challenging the idea of knowledge in the Indian context, which is not very palatable, and it is also very technology dependent, which is not very accessible. I'll pause here. Does that, does that kind of address so what, your questions? And then yeah, yeah. give it back to us. Perfectly, perfectly. perfectly. Perfect. Okay, you. Afi, you can ask your question now. You have raised your hand. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Uh, the answer to the previous question was, you know, it was amazing. I uh, memorized a lot of stuff around that. I have a question that we had around uh, the possibility of Indian communities and affiliates coming under some sort of a hub structure that's being proposed in Wikimedia movement. I would like to hear your thoughts about this. What do you think? Does that make any sense or it just to senseless? Thank you. I mean, no idea is senseless. <laughs> so all ideas have their own value. And I think any form of recognition, any form of coordination for the growth of Indian communities is a welcome idea. Hubs is a very tricky concept. Uh, I, I was part of some of the initial conversations. I was part of the movement strategy team, which kind of where we started initially discussing the term hubs and we had some ideas around it. Now, hubs as an institutional structure will do us a lot of good. But hubs as a programmatic structure might not do us a lot of good. So we will have to have a very detailed and a very, very elaborate conversation as to what its institutional responsibilities will be and what its programmatic commitment will be. The overlap is never going to be a fruitful overlap or the confusion between these two responsibilities is not going to be beneficial 
for the growth of any of the South Asian communities. So at the level of the idea, absolutely, we should absolutely do it. If we are going to implement it, we need to have a very, very uh, serious and a very intentional conversation about what it is, is its institutional responsibility and what will it do as a programmatic structure. Does that help? Yeah, exactly. Thank you. It does. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, Afi. I would also like to have some uh, this opportunity to ask a question. It just came in my mind. It is just, uh, as you uh, said, Tanvi, like it's not a people moment, but an open moment, right? So what, 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 what's there that we can do at individual level to disseminate and to let people know about this Wikimedia thing, right? So people have like, I have uh, come across these situations when people ask me, what, what is Wikimedia? Why do we need to do, you know, the thing you mentioned initially, like we have such questions, what is this make Wikimedia for? And then we uh, come up with this answer. It helps society and contributes for the betterment of the society. So what's there that we can do at individual level? See, there's a, yeah, 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 thanks. Uh, see, there's an easy answer and a difficult answer to this. I'll give you the easy answer first. Uh, the easy answer is persevere. You just hold on, right? Movements are not built in, in 10 years, 15 years. The the Wikimedia movement also is enjoying its, its peak of popularity at this point. There is going to be a dip. There is going to be a decline. It is at that point that the real characteristic of our movement will, will come to shine. So for now, the only thing, and this is the easy answer, okay, which is that you are just patient and you persevere. You don't give up on the movement. The difficult answer, and I think Pavan has his hand up and I'm sure he has a better response to this. The difficult answer is you have to look at what makes it democratic. The democratization of the movement does not only happen because anybody can come in. The democratization of the movement can happen only if anybody can come and stay. So that is the difficult part. Now that involves technology, that involves policy, that involves behavior, that involves uh, you know uh, knowledge and contribution. So that's like a whole jumble and a, and a big challenge at that level. I don't know if that helps, Azra, but some of the thoughts. No, no, that, that completely makes sense. Thank you so much. We have just one more minute left. I want to take a question of Pavan. Pavan, please, it's just one minute. Just wrap up everything in one minute. <laughs> Not not a question. So I just want okay, to say fine, fine. Um, I just want to say quickly that like for a, for an example, um, people have mobiles, but we operate on laptops. People have their own problems, but we uh, discuss and work on uh, our own ideas. So yeah, so there are a lot of people, and uh, we also have a lot of uh, plat. Uh, this platform, there is no non-Wikimedia entity if they, they are open to the idea of open knowledge and also to contribute to uh, some aspects of those things. So the whole idea is that we uh, the movement should be more open. Movement should start embracing other uh, movements which are actually doing a lot towards openness in terms of technology, openness in terms of knowledge, etc. So yeah, uh, the uh, key lies in uh, going, uh, thinking through the process of like people who are out there and doing some something similar to what we wanted to do. Uh, yeah, that's, I don't know if I make any sense here, but I just want to. No, I think that was, that was a very sensible suggestion, Pavan. I think we are on time. Uh, are there more questions? I can stay for a few more minutes, but uh, if there are no other questions, I would like to take one more minute or two more minutes to end with something that I think is important. So questions, thoughts, comments? No, shall I just launch? Okay, so having this larger conversation about the community and affiliates and uh, how do we come together, 
And I say this with a lot of intention that all of you are leaders and all of you are going to be the future and the face of the communities of the initiatives that you work with, right? So I wanted to leave you with these principles, so to say, about what makes or breaks a community. I'm going to go very, very slow because I want this to stay with all of us. I think our values around labor are very, very critical when you think of a community. Now, this might sound like a contradiction to what I said earlier, that community should not have any compulsion or community should not, you know, does not need to have an inevitable. But community still requires energy and that is labor. So at no point should there be invisible labor or unpaid labor. And by unpaid, I don't mean that you have to always write a check for somebody. Recognition, kindness, empathy, you know, offering opportunities, uh, providing references, all of this is recognition. So if you are a community leader, if you are looking at that position, remember that one of the key metric to success of your community is that what is the value that you have around labor? It should never be invisible. Whether somebody is just, you know, arranging chairs or whether somebody is just setting up a Zoom link, no labor, no effort should go invisible and there should never be unpaid labor. The second factor that's very important is what do we do specifically around recognition? Now, recognition can happen in many ways, right? It can happen in an email. It can happen as a barn star. It can happen as a, a, a privately sent telegram message. But remember this, when it is your turn to offer recognition, provide recognition, be generous, be transparent, and always be supportive. Because your support means so much more than an actual benefit or actual, you know, uh, a direct, uh, I don't know, a transactional of any transactional nature. The third thing that all of you must remember, and including me, is that what are our principles around safety and well-being? That we should always be firm. We can't prevaricate. We can't just move from today, this is the principle to tomorrow, that is the principle. We should consciously try to be free from our bias and prejudice. When it is somebody else's safety, when it's somebody else is pointing that this is your blind side, we cannot fall back on our bias. We can't fall back or we can't trust on our prejudice and say, oh, but I understand everything. Remember that if your community does not have a good trust and safety principle or does not have a good well-being principle, it's not going to go very far. And finally, what are the guidelines around financial operations? What do you do with the resource? How are you going to be accountable? It has to be a system for checks and balances. And remember that one of the inherent things that the Wikimedia movement has done well is that it has been able to imbibe frugality as one of its core value. Now, there might be instances where you say, is this frugal? Is that frugal? There are instances. But that is not how the Wikimedia movement functions. For the Wikimedia movement, frugality is a core value, that you are accountable, that you understand that these are resources that are being donated, that this belongs to the larger community. So as long as we have good understanding of values around labor, our principles around safety, the guidelines that we have around financials, uh, financial regulations and financial accountability, and finally, the actions around recognition, I think we'll have a good community. We will have a healthy community. And that is the key for everything that is going to happen in the future. Cool. Thank you so much for giving me this chance.